whenever we consider the days of Noah, I want you to notice what, what God said in the book of Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man on the earth was great. And there was, and, excuse me, and that every intention, notice now, every intention of the thoughts of his heart, notice the internal state of being was only evil continually. There was nothing good found even in the imaginations of the thought processes of man, even in his heart. They were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And friends, if this is true of the sinful state of man in Genesis chapter 6, the very same can be said to be true of man's sinful state in this present day. This, is, this matter is nothing new even to matters within the church. Even the Apostle Paul, some multiplied thousands of years removed from the record of Genesis 6, is having to address some of these very same issues at the church of Rome. I want you to look with me on the screen, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their what? Their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Church, we should continually strive to guard ourselves from being being a cause of division, much less being drawn into matters of division, whether it be predicated upon our ignorance or otherwise. The Apostle John stated this in 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Friends, not everything and everyone and every whatever is from God. The Bible says to test the spirits to see whether they are from, from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. I believe that the contextual point that the Apostle John is trying to make was encouraging the church to be sure to discern whether it was an agenda or it was Holy Ghost. I'm going to say that again. I believe, contextually speaking, that John was trying to caution the church to ensure that things were not agenda-driven, but it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. And if the person is to be led of Christ, or is there a motivation of their flesh? Is it a spirit-led motivation, or is it a fleshly agenda? And the same must be asked of ourselves individually. Are we spirit-led? Or are we agenda driven? Are we led by the Holy Ghost or are we led by our offenses? Are we led by the Holy Ghost or are we led by our unforgiveness? Are we led by the Holy Ghost or are we led by our appetites? Are we led by the Spirit or are we motivated by, by, by sinful motives? Is the Holy Ghost leading us or are we leading us? And the answer to this can only be found whenever we all ask ourselves individually that honest question. Friends, the Bible instructs us that we should work out what? Our own salvation with fear and trembling. Friends, at the end of this life, whenever we stand before Christ, there will be nobody who will be asked to answer for you. You will have to answer for yourself. And my challenge for all of us is that are we where we need to be with Jesus? Am I led by the Holy Ghost or am I stirred up by the emotions and the drama and the things of my own manufacturing? Friends, I can't plow a straight line in my own field while I'm looking at, at, at somebody else's. I've had people ask me different questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm not even going to take the time to even form an opinion on that because I'm focused on my own field. I've had people try to pull me into conversations. Well, pastor, have you considered this? And are you aware of this or that that's happening? Friends, I've learned that I cannot plow a straight line if I'm looking at and, and I'm worrying about somebody else's garden. Friends, I've got enough weeds to contend to in my own garden. I don't have time to be caught up in the drama of somebody else's weeds. Come on, somebody. We need to be willing and understanding that Jesus has called us to our own plow and we should set our face as a flint and focus on making sure that we are plowing straight rows. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, are the rows in your field straight or are they curving? 
Because, uh, friends, at some point, we've got to get our eyes focused back on Jesus. Friends, Peter walked, walked on water because he was looking to Jesus. Those three Hebrew boys thrown into that fire survived because they were looking unto the Father. Church family, the apostles were able to endure unbelievable hardship. Why? Because they never took their eyes off of Jesus. But Peter taught us a principle that whenever we're looking at the master, we can do the impossible. But whenever we look at the issues, we will fall. So my question for all of us today is, who are you looking at? Where are your eyes? What are you focusing on? Are you allowing everything else around you to draw you into their chaos? Or are you standing strong in your own peace with your hand to your own plow going, I'm going to work this thing out for me because I'm only going to focus on Christ and him crucified. Friends, we don't need to allow the things around us to draw us away from what he's called us to. I'm reminded of the scripture whenever Paul talks about Alexander the coppersmith. He says, he's been drawn away from me and he's walked away from the faith. Why? Because he loved the things of this world more than he loved me. Friends, I love the Father. I love Jesus with every ounce of my being. And if I have to stand by myself, I will stand on his word. Because at the end of my life, the only person that I will have to ultimately give an answer for is myself. Is myself. I want us to remember that the broken places in our life may be able to fashion snares that, that would bind us in chaos and in divisions and drama. But friends, we should, should continually strive to guard ourselves from being the cause of drama and much less being drawn into matters of division. Friends, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus no matter what's going on and no matter what is happening. I'm going to set my eyes unto the hill from which cometh my help because my help comes from who? My help comes from the Lord and my eyes are going to be focused on him I'm not going to allow the things of this world to draw me away from having a fruitful fate walk with the master everybody good shout yes, yes. I'm plowing hard today I know it point number three and if I can ask pastor Brad to please come point number three and as I get ready to close the broken places in our lives can shape the snare of shame. So I've talked about the snare of drama, the snare of emotions. Now I'm going to take just a few minutes. I want to talk about the snare of shame. During my time of serving as a pastor, the two baseline issues that I've seen and I continue to see plaguing Christians is shame and regret. The shame and regret of a failed marriage a lost relationship, a broken past, an addiction, a bondage, or the memories of things that you've done that, that are so shameful that only you and Jesus know that it happened. Friends, shame is debilitating. Shame is crippling. It is as if the spinal column of your faith walk is severed when shame takes up residence. Friends, shame, it will keep us from repenting. It will keep us from going to, to someone that, that we've hurt or harmed or asked for forgiveness. Shame will drive us to a corner of isolation. Shame will shatter us. With that said, however, I've also seen this, that shame and pride are twins that are from the same progenitor, but they operate a little bit different. Shame drives us to isolate ourselves or to run from our misdeeds. But pride demands of us that we stand and fight to, to defend our misdeeds even when we're wrong and we refuse to even admit that there was an issue. But the thing that I've noticed with shame and pride both is they both have the same ending. They end in destruction. I've seen those who were walking faithfully with the Lord who made mistakes or, or decisions and they got off track. And what happens? The shame becomes such a root point in their life that they disconnect from those that they need the most because they're afraid of their humanity. They, they are afraid of their issues. They are afraid of the things being known I'm reminded of a story about a king who wanted 
an invisibility cloak. He calls for a man who convinces him that he can manufacture this cloak of invisibility. But the caveat was is that the king had to totally expose himself before he put this gown on to make him invisible. The king puts this gown on and he runs out into the courts and he's laughing to himself thinking that no one can see him. The audience is seeing him in his shame. And the audience starts laughing. The king is convinced that no one can see. The audience is, is convinced that everybody can see except for the king. And how many times have we convinced ourselves that we're the king in that narrative? That we can cover up, that no one will ever see, that no one will ever know. But friends, the Bible is clear that whatever is done in darkness will, will be brought into the light, that the Father has a way at some point of exposing our shame. I was having a conversation recently uh, and, and, and I began to share about the judgment of God and, and I made reference to this. I said, you have to understand that oftentimes whenever we say that we want the judgment of God to smite them down, all of this needs to be exposed. Friends, you have to understand that the judgment of God is always birthed in grace. Can I teach right here for just a second? Oftentimes, we equate the judgment of God to destroy the person because we want them to hurt for what they've done. However, the judgment of God in righteousness is not birthed to a place of destruction. It is birthed from a place of grace. Look, look at the book of the Revelation. Paul is speaking to the, or John rather, is writing on behalf of Jesus to these seven churches. And what's happening? Jesus is affirming what, what they're doing. He's celebrating the good, but he's bringing correction to what's wrong. Imagine being that pastor, standing up on a Sunday morning and saying, I have a letter just delivered by FedEx from the Isle of Patmos on behalf of the Apostle John. I'm going to read this to all of us today because I'm so excited to hear about what, what the apostle has to say. Could you imagine that? Standing up, scrolling through the letter and finding your church. <coughs> and then as the pastor, having to read what Jesus wrote about you. I celebrate this. You're doing great with that. But this one thing I have against you. Friends, the judgment and the exposure of God is always birthed from a place of grace because the Bible says that it's not God's desire that any should perish, but that all, shout all, that all should, should come unto repentance. Friends, whenever God starts exposing shame and exposing sin and judging things, friends, it's those times that we, that we need to be motivated to begin to pray for what God is exposing because the goal of the master is to expose unto repentance, not unto destruction. Now, mind you, that re repentance dynamic is left to us. But I would much rather Jesus expose my issues with still there being a chance of redemption and repentance and not it be, see, friends, you have to understand something that the Bible says that there's coming a day whenever the books are going to be opened and hell is going to give up its dead and the seas are going to give up its dead and the earth is going to give up its dead and everybody, sinner and saint, damned and redeemed are going to have to stand before Jesus and the books are going to be opened. The truth is going to be exposed in this life or in the next. God have mercy on us to give us grace to walk out of the shame that's crippling us today. Friends, like quicksand, shame is a mud bog that will keep you from getting out of and Christ died to, to deliver us from what has bogged us down. I want you to consider the words of the writer of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run what? With endurance. Shout endurance. Friends, God expects us to press in and press through and press on. 
Serving Jesus is not for the faint of heart and it is not for the weak. Serving Jesus will demand everything from you. That we should run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to who? To Jesus. Not yourself. Not a self-help coach. Not any of that. We are to look to who? To Jesus. The founder and the, and the perfecter of our faith. For who, by, notice now, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, Jesus despised the shame of the cross to disarm the shame that is binding you. The sin that caused our shame to be discharged by our confession and our ultimate repentance is if Christ was willing to endure the cross and in so doing despising its shame and sin. But notice, friends, we are now able to stand against that shame because it is the cross of Christ that took that shame out of the way. Friends, my shame is destroyed by the power of the cross. Why do you think Paul said that we should take up our cross daily and follow after Jesus. Why? Because friends, your shame will only die when your cross is present. Your unforgiveness will only die when his cross is present. Your sin will only be broken when his cross is present. You will only be able to walk uprightly in this present age in self-control when his cross is present. You show me a perpetually offended person and I'll show you somebody who has not carried their cross lately. If Jesus endured the shame of the cross to die for our sins, then we too should be willing to despise our shame and our sin because of the power of the cross. To the hurting, you are loved today. To the bound, you are loved. To the addicted and to the broken, you are loved. To those who are ashamed and wrapped up in guilt, you are loved. To the broken hearted, you are loved. To the broken in spirit, you are loved. To, to the depressed and the anxious, you are loved. To the hopeless, you are loved. To the sinner, you are loved. To the saint, you are loved. Friends, we are loved. Jesus endured the cross and despised its shame for the hope that was set before him. And his hope is his church. He endured the shame of the cross because his glory was you. There's no one who's gone too far that the blood can't redeem. There's no broken place that the Holy Ghost can't heal. There's no season of life that God can't walk you through. There's no bondage or addiction that the Holy that the Holy Ghost can't redeem us from. There's no trauma in life that the Holy Ghost can't help us from. There's no valley that his rod and his staff can't comfort us in. There's no difficulty that we will face in this life that we can't endure. Friends, God is faithful when we're not. He's faithful when we're broken. He's, he's faithful when we're ashamed. He's faithful when we're addicted. He's faithful when we're broken. He's faithful when we face the things in life when we don't have an answer to. He's faithful to give us peace when we're facing obstacles in life that make us not want to live anymore. He's faithful to take our hand when we're lost and we're blind. Friends, God is faithful. 
He's faithful beyond my words is preaching. He's faithful beyond anything we could ever imagine or think. Why? Because his word has already been settled. And if I could just get all of you to embrace and understand that today, that your shame may be something that you use as an excuse to say that God can't use you. But friends, I'm assured of one thing. That if he can use me, if he can use me, if he can look past everything that's wrong with me and still anoint me and use me and call me his own, he begins to break down the walls of shame and hurt and trauma and abuse and spirits of fear. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despising its shame. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father because he knew that your shame would stop you. As a church, none of us are perfect. We are all fallible. We've all got issues. But my greatest challenge for all of us is let us lay aside everything that does so easily beset us and throw us off course and let us be willing to refocus on running the race that is set before us. Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. The longer I pastor, the one thing that I come to understand and know is the more grace I need, not just for myself, but the more grace that I need to lead those that God has called me to lead. And I don't believe that there's one person in this room, including those that are watching by television today, I don't believe that there's one person that God by accident connected and placed in this house. I want this church to be a place that the hurting and the bound and the bruised and those who have been traumatized by life can come to and find grace. I want people to be able to walk through the doors of this house and feel the love of God. I want every tribe, tongue, kindred, and nation to be represented in this house because you can't tell me that God wants us racially and ethnically divided on Sundays when his end game in heaven is for all of us to be in one place.